Welcome to our midweek worship service at First United Methodist Church in Warren. Our scripture lesson today comes from First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Hi, I'm Molly Lachlan. Today's scripture reading is taken from First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For what do you pray? What are your expectations when you pray? Another way to ask it might be, what concerns do you have that you just have to bring to God in prayer? I remember years ago attending the third grade open house at the grade school our children attended. Uh, the kids apparently had to fill up papers answering questions that, that I'm sure were meant to help teachers get to know them better, their likes, their dislikes, wishes, wants, problems, fears, etc. Well, in a real sense, it, I thought at the time that, that they might as well have been entitled third graders' prayer requests. Well, this was uh, for our son Joshua. And, and Joshua's list had the following. I want to go snowboarding. I play soccer. I love football. I wish I could drive a motorcycle. The worst thing is having to take out the trash. And then one I just couldn't figure out. I worry about going bald. Well, Joshua, I am reminded of the fourth verse of the great hymn, A Spirit of God Descend Upon My Heart. Teach me to feel that thou art always nigh. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear. Uh, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Seriously, the wants and desires of our hearts, just as the needs and concerns of our lives, are things we are to take to God in prayer. Not simply so that we'll get what we request, but in hopes that God will help us to understand why we receive what we do. In fact, there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer, only answers that we have not yet fully understood. When it comes to examples of prayers and people who pray, there are literally hundreds found in the scriptures. Uh, today's uh, scripture uh, shares with us uh, one particular individual who experienced notoriety in recent years, a man by the name of Jabez. Uh, who is this Jabez? One thing for sure, he's probably been mentioned more in the past uh, dozen to 20 years than he was in the entire previous 2,500 years combined. All we really know about him comes from two verses in the Old Testament. First Chronicles, the book itself written about 500 years before the birth of Christ. Although we don't have concrete evidence, tradition tells us that it was written by the prophet Ezra. The first nine chapters of Chronicles name uh, the book, the, the people of Israel back to Adam. They chronicle the story. And it is in this section that we find the words that were read for us today. And I would like to just reiterate those. Jabez was honored more than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Jabez called on the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, that you would keep me from hurt and harm, and God granted what he asked. That's it. That's all he wrote. That's the sum and total of everything that we know about Jabez. So, what do we know? There was a man named Jabez who was more distinguished than any of his brothers. We don't know what set him apart from his siblings, but there was something that made him memorable. Do you know that, that there are over 500 names mentioned in the first nine chapters of First Chronicles? 
over 500. 44 people are mentioned in the first eight verses of chapter 4 alone, all without any commentary whatsoever. And then for whatever reason, the author interjects and says that one man, one, was more distinguished than all of his brothers. And then, after writing a mere 71 words, he continues with listing people without comment or commentary again. It's as if, in mid-recollection, the author says, now wait, wait just a minute, there's something about this guy that you just got to hear. He's, he's special, but what was it that made him so special? In his popular bestseller a few years ago, based on this simple prayer, author Bruce Wilkinson summarized Jabez this way. One, things started badly for a person that no one had ever heard of. Second, he prayed an unusual one-sentence prayer. And third, things ended extraordinarily well. We know that he got his name because his birth had been painful. The Hebrew word used here actually means to grieve or to be sorrowful. All children cause their mothers a certain amount of pain at their birth, and in most cases, a certain amount of pain the rest of their lives. But this must have been memorable. But we simply don't know why. Next, we're told that, that he is the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Now, that shouldn't have been noteworthy. Here, the author is telling us, all about the people of Israel, that you'd think that they all prayed, or most of them prayed, or some of them prayed, but instead he singles out one man out of all the rest and says he was the one who prayed to God of Israel. So what? And so if it wasn't the act of praying that caused Jabez to be set apart, then it must have been the prayer that he prayed. What was it that set the prayer apart from the prayers of others. It's really not necessarily a, a pretty prayer. It isn't a f using flowery language. It's not filled with religious terminology. It's not a long prayer, 27 words in its entirety. And so if it has nothing to do with the length of the prayer, nothing to do with the construction of the prayer, then it must have something to do with the content of the prayer. What was it Jabez prayed for? Oh, that you would extend, that you would bless my lands. Jabez begins with what seems to be a two-part prayer. Bless me and extend my land. The first thing that we need to understand with this request is that it, what it really means. The problem is that most of us have no idea what a blessing is. Oh, we, we say a blessing perhaps at a mealtime. Someone sneezes, we say, bless you. But to bless someone has, has become more of a courtesy than anything else. It's like saying, have a nice day, or asking someone, how are you? And if that's the way we see a blessing, as simply a, a nice thing, then we'll never really understand Jabez. When the Bible speaks of blessing, it's not a courtesy. In the book of Genesis, when Jacob cheated his brother Esau out of his rightful blessing, the blessing that belonged to Esau because he was the oldest. Do you remember Esau's response when he found out that his brother had stolen his blessing? It's found in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Esau hated Jacob because he had stolen his blessing. And he said, my father will soon be dead and gone and I will kill Jacob. Now that sure sounds as though he's upset doesn't it? doesn't sound like he had lost a simple God bless you because he didn't. A blessing in the Old Testament was the conveyance of God's blessing on everything that a person did. On your family, on your life, on your finances, on your spiritual life. In every area of life, it was being asked that God would pour out his bounty. And that's what he wants to do for each one of us. In 1993, a powerful film called Shadowlands was produced that told the life of the Christian author C.S. Lewis. At one point, his wife Joy is stricken with bone cancer. The original diagnosis is bleak, but after their wedding, Joy miraculously goes into remission. 
Back at Oxford, Lewis colleagues congratulate him on his good fortune. And as they're robing for an assembly, Lewis colleague praises him and attributes Joy's recovery to how faithful Lewis has been in his prayers. And there's a moving scene where this colleague uh, contrasts uh, his own belief in, in the efficacy of prayer with another who is a scoffer, you know, a doubter. Uh, and in response, C.S. Lewis disagrees with both. He does pray, but not to change God. He says he prays because he cannot help himself. He prays because he is helpless. There is nothing else to do. Prayer just pours out of him. And as the men are leaving, Lewis says this line. It's, it's wonderful. It doesn't change God. Prayer changes me. Prayer doesn't change God. It changes me. It is clear that God wants to hear of our troubles because he cares for us. We must never think of him, however, as a God who desires our temporal happiness above all other things. James tells us that we have not because we ask not. So it appears that God does want us to ask, but we should not assume that we know better than God or that by praying we will somehow change God's mind. God does not need to change. We do. When we pray, we recognize our helplessness on God's transcendent wisdom. It, it's through surrender to his power that we yield ourselves to his molding. And Lewis, I believe, is right. The purpose of prayer is to change us. And when we learn to ask the right things, as, as James tells us we should, we find that nothing in God's will is denied. You see, contrary to popular opinion, God is not impartial. He is very partial. He has a favorite, and it's you. And it's not because you're smart, it's not because you're good looking, and it's not even because you're, you're, you are or not going bald. It, it's because uh, God loves you. See, it's not because you're good enough, it's, it's not because of anything you've done. Simply, you are his child. He wants the very best for you. What would happen if instead of expecting the worst in your life, you expected the best? If when you uh, entered a worship service, you went expecting God to pour out a blessing. What would happen if, if you went to work or to school on a Monday morning and expected that God would pour out a blessing on you? What if you expected him to bless your marriage or expected him to bless your children? What if, if when you, you thought of telling others about Jesus, you expected miracles to happen and you expected them to respond positively? God isn't some angry being waiting for us to mess up so he can laugh at us. He's our heavenly father and he wants the very best for us. Notice that Jabez didn't ask for a specific blessing. He wasn't asking God for a new chariot or a bigger tent. He was asking that God would extend his influence. He was simply asking that God would bless him. We can't even begin to imagine what God might have in store for us if we'd only ask and trust God to provide for us. And Jabez continues, please be with me in all that I do. Keep me from all trouble and pain. In the New King James Version, it reads this way, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, and that I may not cause pain. Now that sounds remarkably like part of the Lord's Prayer. You know the part that, that, that says, Matthew 6, 13, don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from evil. However we read it, the first part is the same. Jabez is asking to be in the center of God's will. First, he asked for a blessing for God to expand the territory, and now he's asking God to be in control of the blessing. It's not selfish to ask for God's presence. It's not selfish to ask for God's protection. Your children expect you to take care of them. It's not selfish for them to expect that you will be there for them. So why is it selfish for us to expect God to care for us? 
to ask him to keep us from trouble and to protect us. Often the only time we actually get around to praying is when we're in trouble. Well, why not pray that he keep us out of trouble in the first place? It actually boils down to a question of obedience. If we pray that God will be with us in all we do and then seek to stay close to God, then by default, we're staying away from evil. It's when we decide to go our own way, when we move away from God through our disobedience, that we have trouble and we fall. Thomas Jefferson said the art of life is the art of avoiding pain. And he is the best pilot who steers clearest of the rocks and shoals with which it is beset. Don't see how close you can get to sin. Don't see how close you can walk to the edge. Stay away from the shoals and rocks that can cause the pain. Stay close to the God who loves you. Pray that he will be with you. Now, is it a guarantee that things will always go right? No, no, that's not. But if things go wrong, I want to be right next to the creator of the universe because I figure he can handle what I can't. And when we become disobedient to God, we not only cause pain for ourselves, often we cause pain for the ones we love. And then we have the audacity to blame the Lord. Now, the critics of Jabez and the prayer of Jabez would tell us that the prayer is selfish, that it's, that it's all about me, 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 but, but it's tempered by Jabez asking God to keep his hand on him. When you ask God to bless you and then you give him control, it's the kingdom that benefits. And you know, it's really amazing what can happen if we simply allow ourselves to be open to receive that blessing. When you allow the spirit of the living God to take hold of your life. It wasn't long ago, I was, I was looking out a screen window at the house. And it was a sunny day and I was taken by the beauty of the sun shining uh, through the window and sort of the aroma of the, of the fall air. And then I realized that there was this tiny little weed, flower, actually, that, that had, had gone to seed and dandelion or something like it and had floated up and attached itself to the outside of the screen. And I looked at that for a moment and, and then I attempted to tap it to get it to, to budge, to, to get it to release. And, I, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't go anywhere. So I started to jiggle the screen a little bit and then a little bit more and nothing happened. And, and, and suddenly I, I realized that removing this little weed from this screen became a big deal to me. And I started banging on it and pushing against the metal and, and, and nothing was happening. And I was so frustrated, about to give up and walk away from the window. And then it occurred to me. I bent down towards the flower and I just gave a, a gentle blow. Oh, and the flower took to the air and floated away. What all of the pushing and banging and heavy handedness could not accomplish, a simple rush of wind was able to do. Now, not surprisingly, in the scripture, the presence of God in God's people's lives through the actions of the Holy Spirit is often described as the rush of wind, the breath of God. And when we open ourselves to God in prayer, all those things that we try to fix ourselves, the heavy handedness, those problems we attempt to fix with force and even anger at times, with little or no success, all of a sudden change. If we trust in a mighty and loving God to breathe his life into ours once again and release us to move forward, lifted and powered by his Holy Spirit. It's time to pray like Jabez with confident hearts that God will answer. Remember the words in the account of Jabez, and God granted him his request. In Matthew 21, 22, it says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. In Matthew 7, 7, we read, keep on asking and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened. And then in James chapter 4, verse 2, and yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. Consider these things. Come to God and trust in his answers. Amen.